looking at chapter one, uh, chapter 20 of verse 1. The Bible says, and God spoke all these things. Now, that's very interesting that he starts off that way because it's not what man says. Anytime we read the Bible, it's about what God's saying, right? Man penned it, but God gave him the inspiration. He says in verse 2, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of, out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Commandment number 1. Look in verse 4. You shall not make... For yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven or above or on earth beneath or in the waters below, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to those thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now look in verse 7. This is where we're going to key in this morning. He says, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Let me ask you, has it been a while since you've heard a message on the third commandment? Hmm. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. Bless it now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I say when we begin this series that, that um, you know, the Ten Commandments kind of has this appeal or this, it comes across for so many in the world as being a, a real, something, you know, kind of negative. Thou shalt not. You should not. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. And, and so we got a world that is, man, I don't want to know what I can't do. I want to know what I can do. But let me remind you of something. Every negative has a positive. And when God says not to do something, what he's saying is, hey, if you'll don't do that, but do this, my blessings are going to flow and follow you. And so don't take the Ten Commandments as something bad. It's not. It's something great that you and I both, we need to always apply in our lives. I've entitled this message, How Do We Use His Name? How do we use His name? We're going to find out that you can abuse the name of God, but also we can use the name of God for victory as well. Someone once said that, that speech is an indicator of character. Socrates, when he first met a man, would say this. He said, and I quote, speak so I can see you. Speak so I can see you. You know, in the country, people say what's down in the well comes up in the bucket. And oftentimes, what we say and what spews out of our mouth is a reflection of what's in our hearts, right? Now, this message today, you know, this is one of those messages that may be convicting to you, but it's also convicting to the preacher today. You show me how we use the name of God, and I'll show you or tell you some very true things about your character and about my character. You see, the Scripture deals with the misuse and the abuse of the name of God. Now, I want to give you two things I want you to jot down. Two questions. Number one, write these things down. They're on the screen. Number one, how do we take his name in vain? Let me go ahead and give you the second question, okay? You can fill it in if you want to or wait till later. But how do we take his name in vain? But number two, how, because I don't want it just, just to be negative, but I want to balance this. Thing. How do we take the name of God and use it for victory? Because you can use his name in vain, but you can also use his name for victory. Now, how do we do it? Let me just run through some things. These are some pretty obvious ways that we can use the name of God. Number one, by cursing. By cursing. This is done probably more than any other thing is done. This, is, this sin shows really, somebody once said, an empty head and a wicked heart. Well, what is profanity, what is cursing, what does a filthy mouth say about a man? Well, number one, it shows an utter contempt for God, doesn't it? I mean, it really does. Think about that. Using God's name in vain shows that God means no more to a person than a mangy dog. By the way, let me remind you of something. God does not have a last name. Right? Right? Hold me, brother. I'm spinning. 
God doesn't have a last name. You ever hear people, and, 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 and listen, man, I'm telling you, and, and we don't want to be so legalistic about everything, but I, but I remember the day, listen, I remember the day when you heard, if you heard GD on television or at the movie theater, man, you'd get up and walk out because you would not sit and listen to anybody use your God's name in vain. Now let me just, can I just shoot straight for a few minutes? Here's what's happened. We've become so soft. We hear it so much now. But let me remind you, listen, friend, God does not have a last name. Somebody say amen. God, so, so God doesn't have a last name. So what does profanity show about a man? Number one, a contempt for God. Number two, it shows a rebellion against God. These are not in your outline, but you can jot them down under cursing if you like. It shows a rebellion against God. Exodus 20 and verse 7, I mean, black ink, white paper, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. I know what you're saying, God, but I'm going to do it anyway. Well, it's rebellion, right? It's rebellion. And then number three, it shows that a person's character is rotten. Oh, Sam Jones, he's a former evangelist. I think Sam Jones may have been an old Methodist evangelist from a long, long time ago. He used to say this. He used to say, when I, was, when, I, when I hear a man curse, I lay hold of my pocketbook, for any man who will swear by the name of God may also steal. Hmm. But also, number three, it shows a, a complete lack of understanding. Shows a lack of understanding. Profanity, the word profanity means an attempt of a feeble mind to express itself forcefully. It shows hatred for our fellow man. Hatred for our fellow man. We pray a very wicked and profane prayer when you hear somebody say to somebody else, damn you. If you ever hear that, or if you ever say that, man, listen, man, that is a powerful thing that you're saying. You are praying a prayer over somebody. Man, people say it, all kind of things. People in football games, man, they, they say in, in other places, you ever heard somebody tell somebody else, you go to hell? Go to hell. Man, that's pow Listen to me. That is powerful stuff. Why? It's not funny because Jesus died so that people would not have to be damned, so that people would not have to go to hell. Amen? So, you know, cursing, we, it's, a, it's, a, it's, war, it's a big deal. It also shows a warped concept of God. Shows a warped concept of God. When somebody says, damn you, they are asking God to do something contrary to his nature that God won't, never wants to do, never does. By the way, God doesn't, listen to me, God doesn't ever send anybody to hell. We send ourselves there because we refu people refuse to accept the free gift of salvation, right? So, so, you know, cursing, it's bigger than we think it is, perhaps. But also not only cursing, but number two, by making light of sacred things. By making light of sacred things. Now, what we're talking about, how do we take his name in vain? By li making light of sacred things, making jokes about sacred things. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 4, it talks about that. It talks about foolish talking or jesting or th these things are not fitting. Now, let me talk to all my, um, let me talk to everybody for a second who's over the age of 40. You want to admit that? Anybody want to admit that? All right. Let me talk, because you guys remember and everybody else probably doesn't remember. How many of you remember, how many of you remember the days back when all the uh, Jimmy Swaggart and Jim Baker stuff happened. Come on, anybody remember? How many of you were in church during that time? You weren't in church, but you still remember about it. Everybody saw it on TV, right? You know what? Here's what bothered me about that. Here's what bothered me. Christians, make, remember I'm talking about making light of sacred things. Christians were making jokes about Jimmy Swaggart and Jim Baker, friend. That wasn't funny. They gave in. Listen to, they gave in to the power of the enemy. But man, we had people making jokes. And, and listen, friend, that's not funny. That's making light of sacred things. How else? Number, number three, by hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Jot down Isaiah 48.1. Look at it later. 
Hypocritical profession. Let me give you some things. Hypocritical professions. That is, when someone names the name of Christ as their Savior, but they're not truly saved. Man, we see that all over America. We see that in all of our churches. The biggest, <laughs> the biggest, the, the biggest mission field is not the foreign field. It's not Africa, or India, or even Iraq or anywhere. The biggest mission field is the membership roles in American churches. Man, we got, listen, we got, you, you ever ask a pastor, how many members you got? They always tell you how many members they got. They won't tell you how many people are attending. Because usually it's about an eighth of how many people they're attending. How many members you got? Well, we got 2,300 members. You got 400 showing up. Now, here's my point. Friend, listen. I just believe with all my heart, and I know that people get physical and unable to attend church, and I know things happen and situations and different things like that, but I believe that if you're born again, you're going to want to come to the house of God and worship King Jesus. I just think that. How many other think that? I mean, I think that if, if you really have met Jesus, he saved you, you've experienced his grace, man, you want to come and hang out and be with other believers who have also experienced God's grace. Listen, you want to come and be a part of a church. And we got a lot of people in our roles today in churches, Baptist, Methodist, Assembly of God, the list goes on and on. We got a lot of people that claim the name of Jesus, but they're not really following Jesus. So they're hypocritical. Their profession's hypocritical. Then we got hypocrit hypocritical prayers. Remember Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7? Matthew 6 and verse 7, the Bible says this. And when you pray, not if you pray, but when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. But they think they will be heard because of their many words. We joke sometimes about somebody who's going to eat lunch with us and they pray for 15 minutes, you know, at Chili's. I'm like, dude, catch up on your prayer life somewhere else. Let's eat, amen? <laughs> but then on the other hand, I'm guilty of this too, man. I'm guilty of this too. On the other hand, Lord, thank you for this food, amen? I need some fried chicken. Lord, thank you for this food, amen? And I wonder, right, how much thought and consideration to God are we really putting into that? When we rattle off a prayer without thinking of God, hmm. by the way, we don't say prayers, we pray prayers, right? And then there's hypocritical praises too. Praises. Some people hmm, lift their hymn books in churches. Some people lift their hands in churches. But they never lift their hearts. You know, you can, listen, you can be in a church like ours where there's freedom. Aren't you glad there's freedom in the house? Amen. Aren't you glad there's freedom in the house to worship God? And if you want to lift your hand up, if you want to lift your hand up or both hands up or turn a flip or jump up and down in Jesus' name, there's freedom at Soul Quest Church to do that. But also, just like a church that I would call, well, I won't be mean, where there's not freedom, and if somebody does raise their hand in worship, everybody's like, what's wrong with that guy? You don't want to be that church also that is everybody but two or three raising their hand, and you look at those people like, what's wrong with him? It's not raising your hands. It's the attitude of your heart, right? So you can lift your hand up, you can raise your hymn up, but you haven't elevated your heart to God. Hypocritical praises. But also there's hypocritical proclamations. I just added this one. I like this. Watch this. Giving God credit for something God was a thousand miles away from. Well, you know, God told me to do this. Now, folks, I believe God speaks. The Bible's clear. God speaks. God speaks to us through his word. God st speaks to us through a still, still small voice. God speaks through situations. I mean, we've got a lot of people that give God credit for something God said. Man, I don't know. I, I ain't had nothing to do with that. Right? Be careful. Be careful. So, hypocrisy. By hypocrisy. The second thing I want you to see today is not just how do we take God's name in vain. But I want to spend the rest of our time here. How do we take God's name 
in victory. Because here's the, here's the good stuff, right? Are you ready? Here's the good stuff. There is power in the name of Jesus. And I, listen, whatever you're going through, whatever you're dealing with today, listen to me. There is power in the name of Jesus. How do we take God's name in victory? How do we do that? Well, number one, through salvation. Take your Bibles. If you've got a copy of God's Word, and look in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Acts 4 and verse 12. If you don't have one, just listen closely. Here's what it says. Or look on with somebody else. The Bible says, Salvation is found in no one else. Watch this. <laughs> Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. What's that name? Somebody say it. What's that name? He's the only way. Jesus is the only way. And then also take your Bibles and go to Romans 10 and verse 13. Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. Or just listen to this verse. The Bible says in verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Who's the Lord? The Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall be saved. So, how do we take God's name in victory? Number one, through salvation. You must call upon the name of the Lord. People say, man, how do I get saved? It's not rocket science, folks. Man, we got a world out here that's dying and lost, and they need Jesus. And what the message must be is, call upon the name of Jesus. He's the only one that can save. He's the only one that can heal. He's the only one that can deliver you from that addiction that, that's got you tied down. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus Christ. Call on the name of Jesus. And some of you today... You need to be saved. You need to call on the name of Jesus. But others of you today, you need Jesus' power for your everyday living. Man, some of you, I saw hands go up like crazy a while ago. Things are happening in your life this week. And I'm telling you, there's no magic pill, but I'm telling you, there's power in the name of Jesus. Have you called on Jesus this week? Sometimes we just kind of internalize our problems we pull ourselves to the side and we kind of turn the TV on. Like the TV's going to fix it. If I can just watch some NFL football. It's back, it's back, it's back. I mean, if I could just go to HGTV and love it or list it. I mean, if I can go to the Food Network. And watch this brand new recipe of broccoli casserole. It'll just make everything else disappear. No. Friend, listen, we got to face whatever we're going through head on and know that we got to call on not football, not HGTV, not the Food Network, but not on drugs, but we got to call on the name of Jesus. Jesus. Through salvation, if you want to be saved, you've got to call on the name of Jesus. But also through service. How do you take his name in victory? Through salvation, but number two, through service. We serve by the power of that name. Colossians says this, whatever we do, in word or deed, we're to do all in the name of Jesus. We're to do all in the name of Jesus. I, I don't preach in my name. I preach in the name of Jesus. Our band doesn't sing in their own name. They sing in the name of Jesus. We don't serve in our name. We serve in the name of Jesus. If we're serving for ourselves, if I'm preaching for me, if we're singing for ourselves, wrong motive. You just struck out, brother. We just struck out. We're doing it for Jesus, right? We're doing it for Jesus. We're doing it for Jesus. So we serve by the power of the name. There's power over demons in the name of Jesus. There's power over demons in the name of Jesus. You know, we... Um, sometimes... Now, now, don't misunderstand me. I know Satan and all of his demons. 
By the way, y'all know there's a... Satan is real, right? We know Satan is real. Number two, there are demons, and demons were God's angels, and then they rebelled against God, right? And so they were cast out of heaven, and they became Satan's demons. And they aggravate. Can I get an amen? amen. And they frustrate. Can I get an amen? And they just bother you. And sometimes I'm afraid that we give demons more power than they have. Now, now listen, don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. They're powerful, but they're not all powerful. They're strong, but they don't have all strength. They know a lot, but they're not all-knowing. They can be places, many places, because there's many demons, but they're not omnipresent. Our God, listen to me, our God sees all. Our God is everywhere. Our God, listen, our God can be with me tomorrow wherever I'm at and can be with you tomorrow wherever you're at because our God is all present. He's all powerful. Listen, our God is so much stronger than the enemy. Somebody need to be reminded of that today. Our God is so much stronger that we've got this thing in our mind that, oh, I'm telling the old de demon, oh, oh, Satan, you know, he's, he's a bad dude. He's a bad mama jam. I mean, he's a bad dude. I can't do nothing with him. Yes, you can because, here it is, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Amen. Now, don't just clap if you clap if you're going to clap for God. Through service. I never forget I was uh, early on in my life when I was in my early 20s. No, late, I guess 19, 20, 21. I was kind of like some people, kind of floundering around trying to figure out. I knew God had called me to preach, but I was that guy that, you know, I just, I didn't ever like school. I didn't need no school. I needed God and His Word. I didn't, you know, I was just, you know, I was kind of rebelling against any kind of structure. And so I went off my first year of college to Liberty University and, Came back and went to Jackson State. Didn't like it. Dropped out. Went another quarter. Back on the quarter system. That's how old I am, right? Remember the quarter system, right? Uh, went again. Dropped out. And, you know, went to Union and dropped out. And I've been to a lot. Went to Crichton College, which is out Bible. Dropped out. Call me. Say you're a dropout preacher. Don't say it. <laughs> so anyway, I was. Uh, so I was. I didn't know what I was doing. I knew God called me to preach, but I just. Did not like school at all. I was just like, that's just who I, I didn't like that. It wasn't me. And so I remember one day I was at my wit's end. I called my youth pastor, who was my youth pastor going to Bobby Mullins. And Bobby will probably watch this video. And Bobby said, you know, I told him, I said, I'm coming to Memphis because I'm going to uh, take my test. I'm going to the Army to be an Army chaplain. He said, come by the house first. Long story short, I went by the house. And this, I'm, just, I'm telling you this because this is how much this man meant to me. My mentor, great man of God. He pastors now in uh, Mississippi. And uh, we were there. And before long, we were all three, him and his wife, Wanda, and myself. I think we were all down on the floor on the carpet just crying before Almighty God. God gave him wisdom. God gave him wisdom. And God gave me wisdom, and he let us. I moved in with him for the next eight months and got into another school there in Memphis. And they mentored me, and they... They loved me, and they encouraged me, and they kind of helped me in the right direction. But I say all that to say that my, my mentor, one of my mentors, Bobby Mullins, I just talked about, one of the greatest men of God that I've ever been around. I remember one time Bobby was telling a story. Actually, I was living with him. I believe it was when, when I was living with him this happened. His wife was getting a prank calls. Anybody ever got a prank call? No, they, it, was, it got real serious, and... The person would, but Wanda would answer the phone, and, and the person would, you know, kind of breathe, you know, on the other end, you know, just kind of breathe in the phone. And, and it was scaring Wanda really bad. And she'd hang up. And this was going on. It went on forever, it seemed like, every day, maybe more than once a day. The same would call and just kind of breathe in the phone, and, and, and it was scaring Wanda. She told Bobby about it, and he happened to be home one day, and the phone rang. She picked the phone up. It was that guy, whoever it was, breathing in the phone. She gave the phone to Bobby. And she said this. You can, you can laugh at this if you like, but I think it's, I think it's, 
it goes to the fact that the name of Jesus is powerful. And when we use the name of Jesus, it scares the mess out of the demons. Bobby got on the phone and Bobby said, in the name of Jesus, he didn't scream. He just said, in the name of Jesus, do not call this house again. That's it. Hung the phone up. Never called again. Folks, I'm telling you, listen, there's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. Through salvation, through service, through security. Madison, would you come and begin to play something for me? Through security. We are secure in His name. We are secure in His name. I, you, look, you know what? I don't, have, I don't live my life every day hoping and hoping and praying and hoping and praying that one day I, I make it to heaven. If I can just be good enough to get there, if I can just do enough good stuff, if I don't mess up, I'll, I'll be okay. I, I, I'm, you know, if I can just be good enough. But I want to tell you something, friend. If you've been born again by the power of God, He keeps you by His name. He keeps you by His name. The powerful name of Jesus. He keeps you by His name. One of these days, I don't know when, the world's going to come to an end. I'm telling you, it looks more and more like it every day, doesn't it? With all that's going on in the Middle East and ISIS and all that stuff that's happening. One of these days, the trumpet's going to sound. We're going to meet Jesus, those of us that know him, in the air. The name of Jesus is powerful. And one of these days, there's going to be one last final battle. I'm not going to go into all this too, but I'm telling you, there's one last final battle. You've heard of it before, the battle of, somebody say it, Armageddon. All Jesus is going to have to do. You see, Satan may have all the artillery, the world he could collect nuclear weapons you name it you know what Jesus is going to come in and do speak his name that's it there's power in the name of Jesus so don't use his name in vain use his name for victory but the first thing we got to do is to acknowledge the fact me, you, we've got to acknowledge the fact that we can't do this thing on our own or through our own name or through our own power. Whether you're saved today or whether you've never met Jesus, you've never been saved. If you need strength, if you need courage, if you need deliverance, from some bad habit or from some addiction if you need strength it won't come in the name of Soul Quest Church it won't come in my name or your name but it will come by the name of Jesus and some of us today some of us in the place today we've tried everything else well, if I sit down and watch some ESPN Sports Center, it'll all kind of go away. Doesn't go away. If I could just sit down and watch my soap operas, don't do that. If I can watch HGTV, if I can go and watch the, the Food Channel, whatever it's called, if I can get my Field and Stream magazine and kind of engross myself in hunting or whatever you do, or ladies, Pinterest. Facebook, Twitter. If I can just kind of pull away and get engrossed into this other stuff, and then I'll just forget about all. Listen, we don't need to forget about stuff. We need to call out the name of Jesus and ask Jesus to give us deliverance and healing from these things and victory. God never, 
God, listen, God wants the child of God to live in victory. In victory. So in a moment, we're going to have a commitment time. Some churches call it a time of invitation. A prayer time, whatever you want to call it. But here's the deal. What we need today is we need Christians come into an old-fashioned altar. We call this thing step, whatever. And simply calling out the name of Jesus. God, I need your help. I can't do this. Jesus, 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 give me wisdom. He said, if you don't, if you like wisdom, ask me and I'll give you wisdom. Jesus, Jesus, I can't fix this relationship. Jesus, my kids or my parents, God, they're going through. Jesus, Jesus, I need you, Jesus. Jesus, it's Jesus. There's victory in that name. But I'm sensing, listen, I'm sensing that we get so tied up in stuff and we pour our life into that that we just forget that we're children of the Most High God. And what we need to do is get out of this stuff and get over here at the feet of Jesus and call out to Jesus, God, give me strength, give me wisdom, give me deliverance, give me victory, Jesus, Jesus. Some of you need to find a place. And some of you, say, man, I really need some po- folks to pray. I'm going through some really hard stuff right now. I need some people to pray for me. I promise you, this church is full of people that love to pray. And we want to pray for you. And if you come to the altar and you say, man, I just need somebody to pray with me. You don't have to tell them your problem. You don't have to say anything. Just when you come and kneel or stand, just lift your hand up high. While you're praying, others will gather around you and just pray with you. There's power when we pray together. And then maybe you're here today and you've never been saved. You've never called out the name of Jesus and asked Jesus to save you. I'm going to be standing down front. I would love for you to just come to me and say, Pastor Ronnie, I I want to be saved. I, I want to know Christ as my Savior. I want to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be saved. I'll take God's Word and show you how to do that. That's the commitment time. That's the prayer today. So I want to ask you, in the stillness and the reverence of this moment, would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Every head.